This is Yoo Young Chul, and he has become one of South Korea's most infamous serial killers. Between 2003 and 2004, this man would leave a city in fear, a national press hungry for answers, and a police refusing to acknowledge they have a serial killer on their hands. His weapon of choice? A homemade hammer. With it, he would embark on a blood-soaked reign of terror before finally being brought to justice in a case full of some of the most shocking twists and turns you have ever seen. But Yoo Young Chul was no stranger to breaking the law before he became a cold-hearted killer. He already came with a pretty disturbing rap sheet and a history of prison time. Let's dive right into the unhinged world of the Korean man who ate 26 people, also known as the Raincoat Killer. South Korea, 2004. The owner of several massage parlors in Seoul noticed a suspiciously familiar pattern. Some of the girls in his employment appear to be going missing. As working girls, it's no surprise that they were not noticed missing by family or friends, as many of them led an isolated life. This also made them easier targets. Eventually, the alarm bells ring when the massage parlor owner receives a call from a gentleman requiring the services of one of his girls. Normally, this wouldn't cause alarm. But this call came from the phone of one of the missing girls themselves. An operation began to fool the caller into meeting a girl that was set up by police, and he walked straight into their trap. As Yu Young Chul arrived at the location, he was swiftly taken into custody. But what police thought was just a case of kidnapping and human trafficking, it turned out to uncover one of the most horrific killing sprees ever committed. Unbelievably, during questioning, he admitted to taking the lives of over 20 people, most of whom were either prostitutes or elderly and wealthy victims. And he would eventually show the police where he buried the bodies. What can lead someone to commit such diabolical acts against another? person. Well, this story starts when Yu was only a child, and his upbringing was not without tragedy, setting in a place of series of events that would end up sending him on the path to murder. Yu Young Chul was born into poverty in 1970 in Gocheng and had a difficult early life with other kids at school, mocking him for his family's lower class status. Because some of his victims were wealthy, it's believed that it was his social status as being poor from a young age that would eventually lead to his hatred for those who were much better off than him. He and his siblings were also abandoned by their mother early in life, who left them at their grandmother's home one day and never returned. This was until his father took over responsibility of the children and move them into his home with their new stepmother. But this was no happy home life, as their stepmother was violent towards the children. Then, tragedy struck, as Yu's father passed away in 1985 in a traffic accident, devastating Yu and the family. From here, Yu had a real opportunity to turn his life around. In an effort to escape poverty, he decided he needed to work hard and succeed in life. But after applying for art school, he would suffer yet another personal blow, as the school rejected him. By 19 in 1988, he would eventually settle for a technical school that would accept him with the qualifications he had. But instead of studying hard, he discovered a new way to make money fast, by indulging in a life of crime. It seems crime was not something Yu was very good at, as at only 18 years old, he was caught stealing from a neighbor and a wealthy one at that. Yu was sent to a juvenile detention center, but the punishment didn't end there. Because he could no longer attend the technical school, he flunked his classes and failed the course. From here, his crimes escalated rapidly, stealing more expensive items, cash, and eventually progressing to cars. But in a pattern that will become familiar, he would be apprehended again in 1991, after stealing from his very own landlord. This time, he would face prison, where he would spend 10 months inside contemplating his actions. Despite his questionable record, his girlfriend, who worked as a masseuse, would eventually agree to become his wife and have a son together. And instead of enjoying family life, Yu soon returned to what he knew best and returned to stealing. He was later caught stealing a car and would spend a further eight months behind bars. It was on his release that he was diagnosed with epilepsy, for which he would spend time in medical care before returning to normal life. But his newly diagnosed epilepsy would be something he would later use to his advantage. Yu was no stranger to breaking the law for his own needs. So far, his record was full of theft or similar crimes that didn't really hurt anyone, other than insurance companies, of course. But he would leap from petty theft to sick and twisted individual when he was arrested for selling illegal 
pornography and was sent to prison for two years, only to immediately re-offend on his release and return to a life behind bars for a further three years. And through all of this, his wife had stood by his side, raising their son while he continued to steal and eventually get caught by police time and time again. But she would have enough on Yu's reckless ways, when in the year 2000, he was found guilty of raping a 15-year-old girl and sent down for another three and a half years, causing his wife to finally file for divorce. She would do this while he was still inside, claiming abuse and alcohol-related problems. Upon his release in 2003, he would begin a new path of depravity that would send shockwaves around the world and leave a city gripped with fear. Inside prison, Yu had begun an admiration for a killer by the name of Jong Du Yong, who took the lives of nine people between 1999 and 2000. Each of the victims were wealthy, something Yu appeared to relate to. His hatred for those with money had escalated, and he saw them as the root of his problems. But he had also developed a hatred for women, too, after his divorce, leaving his mind full of dark and dangerous thoughts inspired by his idol, Yong. Yu later quoted that women should not be sluts and the rich should know what they have done, perhaps a stark warning of the terrors that were yet to come. Living back at his mother's home, he was allowed access to his son, but these visitations would take a much more sinister turn. Yu Young Chul had planned to take out revenge on his wife in the cruelest way. He would take her life and then his son's and the visitations would be the perfect time for him to do this. He later admitted that he could not carry out the act in some kind of moral stance. His wife and child would survive this sadistic maniac, but sadly, he would not have such hesitation when he found his next target, the wealthy. In order to be prepared, Yu needed to practice his killing, and he knew exactly how he would go about it. He built his own weapon, fashioning a hammer that packed enough of a punch to kill with its long handle, replaced for a shorter one, customizing the grip to his own needs. Along with a knife and gloves, he had everything needed to enact what he called his revenge. To test his newfound weapon, he began taking stray dogs to secluded woodlands and would then beat them to death in a frenzied and remorseless attack. We've seen many serial killers progress this way, where they often begin their twisted ways on animals before progressing to more human victims. You was no exception, and before long he would find it within himself to begin acting out his revenge on those he hated the most. By September 24th, 2003, Yu had been a free man for less than two weeks before he acted out his plan. He targeted the wealthy region of Sin Sadong, and it wasn't long before he spotted victim number one. Lee Dyok Su was a retired professor in his 70s who lived with his wife, Yon Ok. Without warning, Yu burst into their home around 10 a.m. and mercilessly stabbed Mr. Lee in the neck before turning on his wife. She was bludgeoned with a hammer until Yu returned to Mr. Lee to finish him off. Amazingly, after all of that, he cleaned up and left. He had to break back into the house because he had left behind his knife. He decided that if the scene looked like a robbery gone wrong, it might work as a distraction for investigators. But in yet another error, he trashed the house without actually stealing anything raising a huge red flag for police. They also discovered shoe prints at the scene that would soon become very familiar. Within weeks, Yu struck again. October 9th, 2003, and he finds himself in Gu Ji Dong, fulfilling the same MO, he broke into the house of a wealthy household around mid-morning. After encountering 85-year-old Mo Kang, he butchered her in a depraved act. Before being interrupted by the homeowner's wife, he forced her into the lounge and asked her to bow her head, presumably in some kind kind of execution. She refused. After she told him her son and husband were home, he unleashed his rage and claimed another victim. Next, he targeted her son. What makes this case even more shocking is her son has disabilities, showing what kind of psychopath we are dealing with. He forced her son to kneel down and he hit him with a hammer until the life drained from him, making three victims in just minutes. It would have been four, but the husband was not actually home. It's unclear whether the homeowner's wife lied about him being there to try and scare the intruder away, or whether she actually thought he was home. But this poor unfortunate father and husband would be the one that discovered their bodies in what must have been a heartbreaking scene. Those footprints from the last crime scene, they also appeared here. Now, police had something to go on and began a database search in an effort to try and identify the assailant. Yu was far from finished. This time, moving on to Sam Dong. This time, he would break into a house with just a single resident home 
home. Yu Junhee was a 69-year-old mother. When she encountered Yu in her house, he forced her into the bathroom. There, he would beat her in another terrifying disregard for human life. She was discovered by her son, who miraculously found her still alive. Despite all efforts by paramedics, she sadly did not survive the ordeal, in another tragic and needless end to an innocent life. By now, the media had noticed the proximity of the murders and began to ask questions on the possibilities that these cases may be linked. With the same footprints as several of the crime scenes and the similarities of the deaths, it was becoming increasingly obvious that there was a connection. But in order to avoid a panic by the public, the police denied that the murders were linked. It would take only a few more weeks for Yu's dark desires to overcome him again, and on November 18th, 2003, he would once again take to the streets of a wealthy area, this time in the province of Hiawa Dong. Breaking into a house, he approached the resident housekeeper and produced his knife. She was forced to show him the master bedroom where she said the 87-year-old homeowner, Kim Jong Seok, was. But as well as Kim, Yu came face to face with a problem he had not encountered before. The homeowner's son was in the room with them, and he was only a baby. As Yu Young Chul leapt at the homeowner with his hammer, the housekeeper grabbed the one year old and tried to make a run for the door. She would surely have assumed the worst as Yu snatched the baby and wrapped him in a blanket. Instead of harming the baby, he took him to another room and left him wrapped up so his cries would be heard by the neighbors. With unfinished business, he returned to the bedroom and turned his hatred on the housekeeper who sadly did not survive the attack. Once again, Yu made a critical mistake that he would need to cover up. While trashing the property in his usual attempt to make it look like a botched robbery, he cut himself, leaving his DNA for police to find. And if you thought this killer had any sense of morality by not turning his hammer on the homeowner's young son, then what he did next will sicken you to the core. To hide the evidence of his blood, he set fire to the house, leaving the baby inside and watched from a safe distance as the house burned. By a miracle, the baby was later discovered alive by a family member. Although the blaze had destroyed the bodies and the master bedroom, it had left most of the house untouched. When police checked the home's security cameras, they finally had a look at South Korea's newest serial killer. Wearing a sweater he found inside the house to cover the blood on his own clothing, he's seen only from the back. But it at least gave investigators something to go on, along with yet another set of shoe prints that linked to other crime scenes. Then, Yu just stopped targeting the older, wealthy residents of the city. Who knows, maybe police would have caught him sooner if he continued his familiar pattern. But for now, Yu had other ideas on his mind. He needed a change of scene, one that would eventually lead him to his next inevitable victim. Acquiring a police officer's uniform, he began to extort money from escorts working around the red light district. He was surprisingly very good at this newfound illegal profession, and eventually raised enough cash to move into an apartment where he continued his reckless, indulgent lifestyle. Much like the wealthy were a trigger for Yu's hatred, soon he would find a new hatred for women after he started dating an escort, who he later proposed to. But as soon as she discovered he had already been married and had a shady past, she left him and they never spoke again. The rejection seemed to be the tipping point for Yu, and he wanted revenge. On March 16, 2004, after a short pause in his killing streak, he returned to the streets with only one thing in mind. Posing as a police officer again, he ordered an escort and pretended to arrest her. He took her back to his apartment. Only this time, death would come by strangulation an agonizing end to this girl's life, and surely an indication of just how sadistic Yu Young Chul really was. As if this wasn't twisted enough, it's reported he the girl's head and hung it up to drain her blood. Realizing his third floor apartment was unsuitable for removing the body, he dispersed her into several pieces and buried them in grocery bags behind So Gang University. He then marked the spot where he buried the girl's remains with a bottle cap. But this was not as some kind of marker so he could return to the spot and admire his own handiwork. Oh no. This was so he didn't use the same spot again for his next victims. Yu would break his pattern in his next victim, who was neither wealthy nor an escort. He was in fact a street vendor named An Jae Son. After purchasing fake Viagra that didn't work, Yu put on his police uniform and arrested the vendor for breaking pharmaceutical laws. Using the vendor's very own van, he drove them both to a nearby spot. Spot. If An was suspicious at being taken away in his own vehicle, then he didn't have much time to act on it, as he was stabbed in the head and neck. But in the struggle to survive, 
On injured Yu, who then retaliated with his hammer in a frenzied attack, killing On with over 20 blows to the head. With traces of his own blood in the victim's van, he had no choice but to destroy the evidence by burning the van, along with the body and perpetrator's DNA, in a nearby car park. He was set his targets on the escorts of the red light district once more, and with it, began a short but shocking killing spree that would take many more lives and leave many families grieving for their loved ones, slain by an unremorseful psychopath. This time, he would call escorts to his apartment and bludgeon them one by one before dismembering them and burying their bodies topped with a bottle cap to avoid digging there again. He would follow this pattern with his next nine murders, until one massage parlor owner began to notice the strange disappearances. It appeared Yu was not the best at planning ahead, which had led to many of the mistakes he had made in the past, and this would eventually lead to his downfall. Many of the parlors that the victims worked at were all owned by the same man, and he was missing a girl who had left to see a client. He asked around other parlors, and it became obvious that something was very wrong as a list of missing escorts grew. He also discovered that the same phone number had booked girls at two different parlors, and both had gone missing. Not only that, the number used was from a phone that was owned by one of the missing girls. Fearing the worst, he called the police. Together, the police concocted a plan to try and snare the culprit, assuming the girls were being kidnapped and sold. Sure enough, that very same phone number called back, and the plan was put into action. The escorts arrived at the agreed meeting point, and right at the moment it looked like they may have their suspect, Yu called the girl back and cancelled the appointment. The reason? The girl was too tall. This makes sense when you look at the way Yu killed many of his victims. Even the victims themselves reveal much about the mind behind the man. He often made his victims kneel, displaying signs he liked them to be submissive. Much like the way he chose his targets, he thought they would be easier to overpower, unsuspecting escorts and the elderly or frail. By being confronted with a tall girl, he would have felt less control, and so he called it off last minute. But it would not take very long before they found the ideal girl to play the part, and he took the bait perfectly. Before Yu could act, he was surrounded by police. He was found to be desperately chewing something, which turned out to be the calling cards of several escorts, and his phone? It matched the very phone the police were looking for. But when they got the suspected thief and kidnapper into an interrogation room, what he revealed to them was way beyond anything they could have ever expected. He was taken to the Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency, where he was asked what he had done with the girls. He denied kidnapping and selling them but revealed to the police that he was, in fact, responsible for the murders he committed in the wealthy community. Police were unsure of the confession and didn't believe him straight away. To shock the detectives into action, he told them he had killed over 20 people, starting with a murder in Sin Sadong and finishing with a murder of an escort just days before his arrest. Whether Yu fully planned his next move is unclear, but using his epilepsy to his advantage, he faked a seizure and amazingly, officers actually released him from his handcuffs and then left him alone with the door wide open, believing he was incapacitated. This failure of proper care allowed Yu to escape, where he made his way home and began to destroy evidence. Strange how he would admit to the murders to only try and destroy evidence of them, but it's clear by now that this individual is extremely unhinged and perhaps not thinking straight. He was spotted by a police officer within 12 hours of his escape and once again apprehended, and this time, there will be no escape. Although he changed his story several times, he did claim to have eaten the organs of several of his victims. This was never really proven, for sure, but some of his victims were found to be missing organs, so this sordid, sick claim may just be true. Yu agreed to take police to the bodies of his victims, and it was during this time that he earned the nickname the Raincoat Killer. You see, the term was used more internationally than in South Korea. The reason was because he was paraded around the sites where he had hidden the bodies. His identity was disguised by wearing a large yellow raincoat. The term was born from the media and, although irrelevant to the actual murders, the name stuck and the raincoat killer began to be known across the world. The reality is, is that the police departments working the case were criticized for the way it was handled. Were it not for the massage parlor owners, they may have never caught their man, who's reported as saying he would have continued until he was stopped. Thankfully, he was now in custody and would face trial for his crimes. During the trial, he tried to attack the judge and attempted 
outside while in custody, causing unnecessary delay. Then, while back in court, he tried to attack a spectator and showed no remorse towards the families of those he had killed. Eventually, the inevitable guilty verdict was reached, and this cold-blooded killer would face the maximum punishment the penalty. He currently sits on death row as an execution has not taken place in South Korea since 1997. In fact, right up until this case made the press, the public mood was near to abolishing capital punishment. This series of grisly murders and total disregard for human life angered the country, and the penalty remains in South Korea even if many may never see a execution. This case sent shockwaves across South Korea and remains one of the worst, if not the most disorganized series of murders to have ever happened. But even if Yu Young Chul never faces an execution, we can sleep better knowing he will spend the rest of his natural life inside a prison cell. Let me know what you think of this case in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe to keep up with the world's most disturbing crimes.